All right, let's get this party started. Welcome everyone to Philly Kai's Goodbye Data Visualization and Hello Data Accessibility Event. Risha, you wanna lower our volume and we'll kick this off and go straight yeah. into the intro? Twin Cities, South Philly again. Cool, cool. Once again, everyone, welcome to Goodbye Data Visualization. Hello, Data Accessibility. Uh, Rachel, we take us to the intro slide, please. Again, thank you all for joining us and making the time to connect tonight. Tonight, we are thrilled to host a special talk from Kent Eisenhuth. He is a native Philadelphian working at Google. Kent has a lot of interesting insights to share around data visualization and accessibility. So to kick tonight off, just want to lay some ground rules and some quick logistics. One, everyone will be muted by default and your video will be off. That just help keeps the noise to a minimum during the presentation. Also, please use the chat for general discussions and comments. We also have the Q&A feature. If you have any questions for the speaker after the event, Feel free to drop them in there and we will try our best to get around to those at the end of the event tonight. And Zoom also has the closed caption feature turned on if you would need it. And this event will be recorded and shared online. And finally, as we're all working through the Zoom error, we appreciate your patience if any difficulties should arise. Rachel, should we take us to the next slide, please? For those of you who don't know who we are, we are Philly Kai, that is Philly Computer Human Interaction. And Philly, Cla Philly Kai is an interdisciplinary group committed to advancing UX CHI profession. We are the special interest group of the American Computer Machinery Association. And we have been curating networking and educational UX events in the Philadelphia area for over 15 years now. We are very dedicated to UX knowledge sharing and we couldn't do it without each and every one of you spending your time with us. So we thank you very much for making this possible. Just as a reminder, we are also committed to supporting a very respectful environment for our members to come together and talk about all things UX. If you do witness any unacceptable behavior during tonight's event, please notify a board member in the chat or reach out to us directly via email. We encourage all attendees to read our code of conduct on our website for further information. And with that, I will hand it over to Rachel to do an introduction of the 2021 Philly Kai board. Thank you, Ben. Hello, everyone. So Philly Kai board is run by volunteers and for the 2021 board, we have four of us. Ben Swafford is the chair. Remy Gurak is vice chair. Benjamin Dolly is the treasurer and I am the secretary. And you will meet us all uh, throughout the event. So tonight's schedule, the presentation will start at 6.45 p.m. and it'll be followed by a Q&A at 7.30. And at the end, we'll announce the raffle winners at 8 p.m. So for raffle today, we have these three books by uh, Rosenfeld. Uh, as I mentioned, winners will be announced at the end of the event and we'll reach out afterwards to get the addresses so that we can um, so, so we can send a physical copy of this book, no matter where you are in the world. Uh, so for the ones who's joining a Silica event for the first time, we have a job time at every event where we try to connect job seekers with companies that are hiring. And since we are a local chapter, so we will be only focusing on Philly roles. So let's start with the companies or people who are hiring. If you're a part of a Philly-based company and you have roles open, please drop a link to those roles in the chat box. Also, we invite you to raise your hand and we can unmute you. So you can talk to, uh, briefly explain the role and the company. Do you see any hand raises, anyone? Uh, let's see, we've got one hand raised from Andy. I'm gonna... Unmute you here. Okay, hey everybody, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes. Yeah. I'm Andy McDonald, uh, lead service designer at Frog in Philadelphia. Uh, so we're part of Capgemini Invent. Uh, it's a fairly new announcement. It's coming out this week. 
Uh, we're looking for an associate director of design research. So this will be a management role uh, leading uh, researchers within our group. Um, and then we're also looking for an executive design director uh, for the Philadelphia studio. Um, so that would be leading the whole design team within. Thank you, Randy. Is there anyone else? Let's see, we've got one from Lydia. I'm gonna allow you to unmute yourself. Okay, hi, can you guys hear me? Yeah, hi, Lydia. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm a UX designer at Message Agency based out of Philadelphia. Um, we're currently looking for a front end developer who's got some knowledge of UX. We, that's a, a big plus for us, but um, I'll post the job in the comments. Uh, I work remotely, I'm from Lancaster, but I think we're looking for someone in the Philadelphia area uh, as we start to get back into the office. So yeah, front end developer, guys. Okay. Thank you, Lydia. Is there anyone else? Let's see, we've got a couple raised here. I'm gonna go to Phil Sharon. Phil, are you there? I'm here. Hey. Hey, everyone. This is uh, Phil Schroen from Think Company. We have, uh, well, we've got a bajillion roles open, both in uh, design, um, content strategy, uh, project management, um, research focused roles, and technology uh, front end developer focused roles. So I'll, I'll post a link in the, um, uh, in the chat rather than go through all of the roles on their own. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. All right, uh, I've got three more hand raises, so let's try to get through all of, all of them. Um, I'm gonna unmute Rose. Hi, uh, so the team that I'm working on, um, I posted a link, there's five different roles that we're hiring for. The one that I'll highlight is the one that would work closely with me because I'm biased, um, which is a data instructional specialist. We um, are part of this larger organization at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia trying to um, basically improve data literacy throughout the entire institute and allow researchers to better conduct their research and connect research and clinical data. And so we're looking for someone to help us um, basically create materials uh, to train um, doctors, physicians, clinical scientists. Um, yeah. Thank you. Hey, thanks. All right, uh, Krista should be able to unmute now. Hi, my name's Krista. I work for Chatham Financial. We have quite a few uh, software development roles available and platform engineering roles available. I posted a link in the chat. Thank you, Krista. Cool, and I, I see a hand from Lydia, but I think maybe you already spoke, is that right? I'm allowing you to unmute in case I'm wrong. Yes, that's a mistake, I'll lower my hand. Thing. Okay, <laughs> okay, thanks Lydia. All right, that's everybody. Okay, moving on to the job seekers, if you are looking for a job right now, feel free to reach out to these individuals who uh, just spoke. And also you can share your LinkedIn profile in the chat if you want. So now I'll pass it on to Ben. Software. <laughs> okay, hi everybody. Um, we go to the next slide here. Great, so yeah, it's my honor to thank our sponsors. Most of our Philly Kai events are free and it's thanks to the support of these organizations. Um, our uh, annual sponsors this year, I think company O3 World, Rosenfeld, who provides our uh, books for the raffle, Vanguard and Blue Plate Mines. And I wanna give a really special shout out to Boomi, who is tonight's event sponsor, um, who's also providing some exciting swag items for the raffle. And I wanna pass the mic to Tracy to tell you a little bit about Boomi. I actually can't hear you, Tracy. Uh oh. <laughs> Give you a second there. Still can't hear you. One exciting thing about Boomi is that they are now just Boomi, not Dell Boomi.
Yeah, something weird must have happened. We did test this, I promise. We could hear her earlier when we did our test <laughs> to make sure we could hear everyone. I can assure everyone. How about now? <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It worked fine in the test, and then I made the mistake <laughs> of switching back to my headphones. Noted. Okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for your patience. Um, I'm Tracy Krupp, and I lead Boomi's user experience organization. We are based in the Philadelphia suburb area, but um, we are global, and as Ben mentioned, we are newly independent. Um, our team is really happy to sponsor tonight's event. Ease of use is a core principle to our platform, and uh, and we know that what's required by many is beneficial for all. So this talk really hits at the, the heart of what we value and the fact that Kent is the speaker is simply a bonus. Um, more about Boomi. We're a company with the mission of helping organizations connect across their businesses. We're talking about their data, their processes, people, systems, tools, all of it. And we help our customers do this quickly, easily, and confidently. We're also a leader in the iPaaS space. iPaaS is Integration Platform as a Service. And we've been recognized by the Gartner Magic Quadrant as an iPaaS leader for eight years running now. Um, we're also consistently named as one of Philadelphia's best places to work. And incidentally, we are also hiring. Um, as you'd imagine, currently we are fully remote, but we're also committed to remaining remote friendly, uh, even when it's safe to return to site. So as a newly, a newly independent company, we're going to have a lot of growth in the next year. So we have a number of positions that we've been actively hiring for, including um, research and product design roles at various levels in my organization, but also engineering positions in my, my counterparts organization. Um, the current openings for UX are specifically open um, to North American based candidates only right now, but we are a globally distributed team and we'll be posting additional openings um, in the subsequent months and uh, those will be available in a number of additional regions. So you can find those on our website, boomy.com, as well as posted across LinkedIn. So thank you all for being here. I'll pass this back to Ben. Hey, thanks, Tracy. Thanks again for, for the support and partnering up on this event. Okay, go to the next slide here. And uh, yeah, we are noticing that, that some of our slacks are coming through. Sorry about that. We'll try to fix, <laughs> fix that for the next time. And uh, we'll try to keep the slacking to a minimum while the screen shares up. So our next event, we, we have a Philly Kai event about every month. And uh, November is World Usability Day. Philly Kai is proud local, local uh, host of this event. So that will be coming up uh, about mid-November and we'll be announcing that shortly. This is also a, a call for submissions event. So we'll be putting out the call to the community for talk submissions. So we're very excited. With that, I'll pass it over to Ben to introduce Kent. Um, all right. I. I'll be introducing Kent. Um, oh, sorry, I'm Remy. sorry. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm Remy Garak, um, and I, along with the rest of the board, and I'm sure all of you are very, is very, very excited to have Kent Eisenhuth here with us today. Um, and just a little bit about Kent for those of you who are not familiar with him. Um, he has led product teams for the past 15 years in adopting user-centered design methods to solve complex business and consumer problems. He is a staff UX designer at Google, and while he's been there, he started the first advanced visualization, visualization library at Google, and he also co-authored the data visualization specs for material design. Before joining the cloud data visualization team, he helped pitch and established Rivet as a Google Area 120 product. That app is responsible for helping over 15 million K through fifth grade students learn how to read using artificial intelligence. His work and ideas have appeared in many publications, including Fast Company, TechCrunch, The Guardian, and Smashing Magazine. Finally, he's presented talks and ideas at many conferences, such as IDA's interaction, South by Southwest, and he's a frequent guest lecturer at universities in the greater Philadelphia area. 
So we feel honored to be in such great company there. Um, you can connect with him on Instagram, Twitter, and through his website, which we can post those links um, in the chat. Uh, it seems like if you search Kent Eisenhuth, his name, all of those should come up, um, but I'll make sure those get in the chat. Um, and I will pass it off to Kent to take the reins. Awesome. Thank you very much, Remy. It is truly an honor to be here. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to go ahead and share my slides real quick, and then I'll uh, kick this thing off. Hang on one second. Okay. Awesome. So uh, first of all, just want to thank Ben and Remy and the Philly Kai community for inviting me to do this talk. Uh, this is actually quite an honor for me because uh, I've been practicing UX and design for about 15 years. And about 10 years ago is where I really found my passion for UX right here in the Philadelphia area, working at Electronic Inc. And I just want to say it's great to see some familiar faces and names coming up in uh, the chatbot, and uh, you know, it's also great to meet some new folks and uh, some people in the the newer generation of designers in the Philly area. It's really exciting for me to connect with you, and you know, for everyone else who joined from all over the U.S., um, it's an honor that you know you found us, and uh, thank you for joining this talk. So for tonight, we're going to uh, reframe the term data visualization. And for the next 45 minutes, I want us all to start thinking about it as data accessibility. And in order to do this right, we have to rewind a bit. And first, we're going to take a look at why data visualization has been a popular and useful tool for hundreds of years. So as human beings, we have this innate ability to spot trends and patterns. We can even identify outliers just by looking at visuals and information presented by the environment around us. And we're doing this subconsciously, whether we know it or not. And if you don't believe me, we're gonna take a look at a few examples here. So let's start with this apple. When you see it, its initial appearance might you know, look kind of tasty to you. Uh, it's green, it's polished, it looks like something that you might want to eat. Hang on a second here. But in comparison, the second apple, its very appearance, might turn your stomach a bit. You know, I know when I was putting these slides together for this talk, uh, when I first saw this, I have to admit, I kind of puked in my mouth a little bit. Looking at this image, it's quite easy to tell that somebody has been here before. And in looking at the next image, we can see very clearly that this is a path that has been very well traveled. And then in my last example, I just want you to imagine that you are on this beach and you're trying to find a place to set up camp for the night. I can't imagine that you'd want to set up camp beneath these windswept trees because clearly this might be a dangerous place. It looks like it was exposed to the elements. Now, if we think about these last four examples that I shared, we came to these conclusions fairly quickly when we first saw these images, probably within milliseconds of first seeing it. So this is proof that as humans, we have this ability to just pre-attentively process information presented by the environment around us. And of course, this is something that has been studied time and time again. Now, if we think about visualizations, these are graphics that actually leverage these natural capabilities we have, these capabilities that help us survive as a species for hundreds of thousands of years. And if we think about what a great visualization does well, oftentimes it can help us make sense of an incomprehensible data set. If it's done very well, it can help us make more well-informed decisions. It can help us understand a difficult problem space and a lot of benefit can come from that. So I wanna show this example because we can pull out some very quick visual patterns just by looking at this graph. And for those of you Tufty fans out there, you might already be familiar with this. This is a visualization of Napoleon's um, march on Moscow during the Patriotic War of 1812. 
And some people think that this is one of the greatest visualizations of all time. I actually think this is one of the greatest anti-war posters of all time. And this does a fantastic job of using visual patterns, the way it's presented to us, the information, we can quickly spot those patterns. We can identify some really interesting trends, all in support of telling the story of the events that actually happened during this campaign. So I'm gonna start on the left here and just show a few examples. So this is actually a mashup of several different types of visualizations. This is actually a flow diagram overlaid on a map. And then we have a few supporting charts, like a line chart that um, accompany this that help tell part of this story. So a couple of key visual patterns here that might jump out at you is this map is, uh, you start to read it on the left here, in the border of Poland. And if you follow this gold line out to Moscow, this shows the route that Napoleon's army took. And the thickness of the line represents the number of troops at any given point in time during this invasion. Now, this graph, one thing that you might notice is if you look all the way out in the left where the troops arrived in Moscow, the size of the army was less than one fourth of what it was when they first started back in Poland. I think that's a visual trend that really jumps out here. And what happened in real life is that uh, there was a lack of planning on the part of Napoleon and uh, his army. Well, initially they thought they had enough supplies. They felt that they could just live off the land as they journeyed out into Moscow. And they didn't take into account the type of land that they were going to be traveling over. So this took place in some of the summer months during this time, at least the pursuit the trip out to Moscow. And what ended up happening was um, soldiers starved. Uh, they didn't have the necessary provisions to make it there. They weren't able to live off the land. Uh, some people fell ill to different diseases. And the entire time this was happening, the Russian army was actually retreating uh, to Moscow. And the other thing Napoleon didn't account for is that uh, there was going to be several points where guerrilla warfare tactics were used by Russian peasants along the route. So slowly, the environment, the lack of supplies, the guerrilla warfare whittled the army down to being one fourth the size of what it was. And I think there's a really nice visual pattern in this uh, visualization that that clearly highlights that. Now, the dark line uh, highlights the return journey from Moscow back to Poland. And we'll notice that some interesting events happened along the way. So once again, the thickness of that line represents the amount of troops in Napoleon's army at different points along the path of retreat. Now, this actually took place in the late fall. And if we think about fall in Russia, it, you know, it might occur to us that it's a quite a cold time of year. And once again, the troops were ill prepared for this return journey. A lot of them had summer clothes. They didn't have the proper wear to just endure the, the cold temperatures that they were going to be faced with. So at every key point in this, you'll notice something that might jump out at you here. There's a connection drawn between visual dips in the number of troops, and then there's a correlation drawn to this temperature graph down at the bottom. And very quickly, we can spot this temperature trend and visually map that back to a loss of troops. And a lot of troops died of hypothermia. Another example is uh, when we're kids, at least most of us, it's ingrained in us to learn how to read maps. So I think something that jumps out very quickly here visually is the Berez uh, Berezina River in Belarus. And you'll notice that the path along the retreat here, the number of troops is cut in half. And what happened during the war is that Napoleon, um, Napoleon's forces were basically locked into a position where they had to burn and destroy the makeshift bridges they were using to cross this river. So several folks in the French army troops and um, innocent people even were left stranded. And basically the, the size of the army was cut in half here. And then finally, what I'll leave you with is when we look at the very end, that's when I think the most obvious visual trend jumps out here and again, once we know what's going on with the graph, what the thickness of these lines represent, it's very obvious to us that a fraction of the troops actually made the full journey out to Moscow and then were actually able to return. And that's why I think this is one of the greatest anti-war posters of all time, because it really shows off the lack of planning, 
the lack of thought, the lack of consideration for logistics that went into this campaign. And it was just an unnecessarily waste of resources and in life. And the visual patterns presented by this diagram that leverage those capabilities we have as human beings really comes forward here. And once we know a little information and context about this visualization, these visuals really help us tell a rich story about this major historical event. So that's quite an old visualization. It's a classic, uh, but we've been using visualizations uh, since then. So this is a visualization that we created at Google as part of Google's COVID response last year. And this visualization was helping billions of people understand the geographical distribution of COVID cases. We also use visualizations to help people in different regions understand the spread of the virus and case rates in their local areas. And then subsequently when vaccines were rolled out, uh, we created visualizations that would help people understand vaccination rates and the availability of vaccines in their local areas as well. A couple of interesting technical visualizations that uh, we created. Uh, this was one for our Google Cloud customers. Uh, this enables developers and operators to better visualize and understand the performance of a query running on a database. So kind of switching gears here from the pandemic to something a bit more technical. And then we also have created some UX visualizations and tools for uh, some of our different teams. In this case, we're helping designers and content strategists visualize an app's taxonomy. And then we're actually helping researchers overlay critical user journeys and walk through them on top of these um, visualization tools that we've been creating and using. And then finally, it wouldn't be a Google presentation without talking about some of the more experimental projects that have been taking place over time. So here I'm going to highlight Google X and the now defunct Project Loon. Uh, but at the time in which this uh, project was active and it was running, um, the, the Loon team and Loon customers, which were satellite operators, site reliability engineers, relied on a series of visualizations to understand the health of the Loon network, how different nodes uh, within the network, such as payloads on a balloon, were able to communicate with each other. And then they were using some visualizations to better understand the environmental factors impacting a balloon's ability to communicate with uh, stations on the ground. So we found that data viz really provided a lot of value for some of the more experimental initiatives that were taking place at that time. So I want to do a quick thought activity in the spirit of data viz. I shared a few examples here. And I want you to take a minute and think about how many ways in which you can represent these two values of 7 and 14. So take a minute to think about it. As you're thinking about it, I'm going to just uh, share a few ideas that I came up with. Uh, one way, I think that's the most obvious way, starting in the upper left corner of this slide, is just simply writing out the two characters, the number seven and the number 14. And in the spirit of doing that, there's obviously different characters we can use to represent these two values. So moving down here, I thought about using Roman numerals to represent seven and 14. And for those of you who know me, uh, my wife and I are really into board games and the popular method for keeping score in certain games is to use the series of ticks and slashes and multiples of five. So in the top row here, I have a series of uh, seven marks. And in the bottom row here, I have a series of 14 marks. Thinking back to what I had mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, ways in which we can really leverage those natural capabilities we have as humans to identify trends and patterns. I use some basic gestalt principles to show a grouping or cluster of uh, seven dots and 14 dots. Uh, moving down, I did the same thing with interlocking triangles, uh, making more of a fun architectural-like visualization here. Uh, but there's more to that relationship than just visualizing the sheer quantity. If we think about the relationship between the two values, seven is half of 14. So in another example, I created a line that was half the length of the other. I took that one step further and created a donut chart where half the chart is filled in. The entirety of the chart representing the value of 14, the filled portion representing the value of seven. And then last but certainly not least in the upper right, um, I started experimenting with the areas of circles. 
So I hope you thought of a few ideas as I was going through this slide. I tried to stall a little bit just to spark some creativity. Uh, for those of you who want to share, feel free to share some of your interesting and awesome thoughts on this uh, during the Q&A section uh, at the end of this talk. Love to hear what's on your mind with that. So moving along, everything that we had discussed up until this point is all specifically related to data viz. And I hope you can see why this has been such a powerful and valuable tool for hundreds of years. But even during this time, we've been making a bold assumption all along. In order for this to work, we're assuming that everyone can see. And as we all know that that isn't the case. In fact, in the United States alone, according to Stack Exchange, over 4 million people rely on assistive technology to view website content. So what I want you to do now is let's rethink that exercise. And I want you to think about how you might represent these two values of seven and 14 to somebody who can't see. I think this is really going to change the game and the way in which we think about this design challenge. So once again, I thought about this and I'm going to share some thoughts on this and some of my solutions with you now. Seven, 14. So I hope this thought activity has made it clear that we really need to start rethinking our approach to how to represent data in a way that's accessible to everyone. So uh, I actually had worked on Google Materials um, data visualization guidelines. I co-authored the specs and uh, you can check them out for yourself if, if you're familiar with them, that's great. Uh, it's out at Material.io. Um, and we did this about two years ago. I partnered with some folks in my team and, and we co-authored this content uh, together. And during that time, we actually had partnered with the material design team and they, bas they basically asked us to think about what does data viz mean to Google? And what makes a chart a Google chart? Now, that's a pretty big question to answer. And at the time we felt it was a pretty tall order. So what we ended up doing was we partnered with uh, several different uh, stakeholders and different teams in key product areas like Google Analytics. Uh, we worked with some teams in cloud, search, uh, geo, and of course the material design team. And together we came up with these six guiding principles for designing any chart. And really these principles can work um, for obviously Google charts, but we started to realize that these were solid enough guiding principles that um, they could be used external to Google. So, you know, if you're working on a data visualization project, uh, these principles might be worth keeping in mind. But as I had previously mentioned, this presentation isn't just about data viz, it's actually a tale of two disciplines. And this is more about the intersection of data and accessibility. So with that in mind, let's think about how we can reframe these principles and see how they apply to making accessible data experiences that provide value to everyone. So the first step in doing this, we're going to reorder the principles. And uh, in this reordering, we're going to start up front with some very basic and fundamental principles. Uh, we're going to extend out into some of the more delightful principles. And then finally, I'm going to talk a bit more about how to scale up some of these ideas in, in your everyday work and how you can apply them to uh, the products that you work on or the clients that you might be uh, doing some design consulting for. So we'll talk about the first five because these can be directly applied to existing charts. And the first one, I'm going to spend a, a fair amount of time on this uh, because it's very foundational and arguably one of the most fundamental principles that we have in making data accessible to everyone. And there's a couple of different ways in which we can think about structure here. Uh, the first that I want to bring up is all about providing um, a structure that's intuitive to navigate. And 
a lot of people that you know we're thinking about here. Uh, not everyone has the ability to to move a mouse and to uh, use it to interact with um, an interface or a product. And we have to think about ways to set up patterns for people who are using keyboards. Now, this might sound pretty obvious at first, because if you're thinking about basic donut charts and line charts, uh, the first inclination is that, hey, maybe we could just, you know, tab through the different data points, uh, you know, check out some of the different metrics that are displayed in the chart and learn a little bit more about their values. Sure, you know, on the surface, that, that seems reasonable, but I'm gonna show this uh, example here from the New York Times. And this is a visualization of COVID hotspots in the US. And how this visualization worked is that at the time you could actually hover your mouse on any county and it was using um, a color ramp to show the basically illuminate the hotspots across the country at the county level and you could actually hover on the county and learn a little bit more about the specific numbers in that area. And even see a, a nice little spark line that revealed uh, the county's uh, trend information. Now if we're thinking about how to navigate this using the keyboard. Uh, like I said, maybe our first inclination is to tab through all of the counties. But when you start to think about it, there's 3,006 counties in the United States. And as designers, we have to ask ourselves, is it responsible to require somebody to tab through all 3,006 counties, especially if all they want to do is interact with some information or a data table that appears after this visualization component? And I think the answer to that is no, because that's quite a lot of tabbing that would take quite a lot of time. So going back to the map, um, if we were rebuilding this map, some things that we might want to think about are ways in which we could simplify the navigation. So for example, it could be that we tab through all 50 states and perhaps you can um, establish some sort of hierarchy here where you can select a state and then um, begin to tab through the counties in the selected state and you know, learn more about the recent trends and, and information that's available. That's one potential option. Uh, perhaps we could consider alternative keys. Maybe we don't use a tab at all. Maybe we can tab into the visualization and use arrow keys to um, arrow around to the different counties and find out more about you know, the specific uh, case rates uh, in those areas. And maybe we could consider using something like keyboard shortcuts. So if this map is truly about the hotspots and only the hotspots, maybe there's some sort of shortcut that will enable us to navigate the top you know, 10 largest hotspots in, in the US, or we set some sort of threshold in, and navigate it that way using a keyboard shortcut, only highlighting what we think is going to be interesting for a user. Now, I'm not going to propose a, a hard answer to this question, but just provide some things that we could think about, some nice alternatives for how to structure this. Now, not all of visualizations are as concrete as a map. This was a network visualization offered by LinkedIn. Uh, this was a visualization tool that allowed you to basically view your network all of your connections and how they're connected to each other. So it's a, a classic network graph. Uh, this has been since deprecated, but it's a really interesting example because a lot of us have on the order of hundreds to maybe even thousands of LinkedIn connections, depending on how often you use the, uh, the site. And if we think about how to apply what we had discussed on the COVID map to something like this, it's a little bit more abstract. So this visualization uses color coding to group people or circles, if you will, that are tightly interconnected. And these could be maybe people that work at the same company. They might be people that um, travel in different um, social circles or professional organizations like Philly Chi, for example. And ways we might think about this is um, using tabs or some sort of alternative like arrows to uh, navigate to a group. And perhaps you might be able to select a group and then jump down into the actual nodes of the visualization and navigate through all the people and their different connections. A lot of this actually goes back to um, the purpose of the chart. And in order to properly structure it, it's important to think about uh, the questions people are going to be asking of the data um, represented by this chart, uh, but something to definitely uh, think about. So it brings up a best practice that um, I've always kind of embraced and, and my colleagues at Google have, and that's a good visualization, especially a complex visualization like a network viz or like a COVID hotspot map that I shared. 
Um, it's always nice to provide a clear overview with um, a path to getting more detail on demand. So think about how you might navigate the, the top level of the visualization and then think about ways in establishing a hierarchy and enabling people to um, find out more information as they further investigate the visualization and really drill into the data. And this can unlock a lot of ways to really think about how to properly uh, structure uh, the visualization so it's easy to navigate with a keyboard. Uh, this is something that we've been thinking a lot about in our more complex visualizations that are offered in, in Google Cloud Platform, such as uh, the use of our Sankey diagram in, in several different GCP products. Uh, we've been thinking a lot about how to surface metrics on the links of a flow diagram, for example, how to enable our customers to quickly spot bottlenecks and flows and inefficiencies and spot all those things that a flow diagram, for example, uh, highlights very well. Uh, another way that we can provide structure, and uh, this is for any you know, software engineers, web developers, UX engineers that are in this presentation, um, is thinking about how we're building the chart. And it's always important to use the proper um, ARIA roles, the right landmarks, labels, and attributes in your code. If you're not familiar with ARIA, it stands for Accessible Rich Internet Application. And basically, it's a set of landmarks and properties that tell your browser how to interpret all the elements of your chart. So basically it can interpret the chart as a whole, but then you can also use these attributes and roles and landmarks to describe everything from the chart's headline to the individual data points that are displayed on the chart, even all the way down to its labels and the X and Y axes. And the reason why this is important is because if we do it right, we're properly describing the purpose of the chart and the information displayed to the browser, which is really going to be passed on to a screen reader. So somebody who actually can't see the chart has a general understanding of the purpose of the chart, its graphics, and uh, the information that it represents. And finally, I always love this slide because I'm more of a visual thinker, but uh, and, you know, we think about data viz as being better than tables a lot of times, but what we've been finding in our research, especially for people relying on assistive technology like screen readers, is that some of these people are, are quite gifted in the ability of being able to just access a data table, even a very complex one, and, and pulling insights out of it because they're, they're just simply used to navigating it, finding the information they're looking for, and moving on. So providing access to the underlying data in a tabular format uh, sometimes is valuable. And I don't want to suggest this is a cop-out or a catch-all because I think there's things we can do in the chart itself to make it provide more value and insights for those people. But if you have a, a robust accessibility testing program um, in place at your company, or if you're in consulting and you're working with um, another consultancy that does accessibility testing, you can very quickly find the right times to um, lean in on this uh, table alternative. So I spent a lot of time on this fundamental foundational principle on providing the right structure. Now we're going to get into some of the more uh, fun aspects of this. And this is actually one of my favorite principles that we came up with. It's all around lending a helping hand and providing the right context uh, to help people really understand what's going on in the visualization, prioritizing data that might be interesting depending on you know, the questions the visualization is meant to answer for uh, the people looking at it. So um, going back to our COVID response visualization, the worldwide view of the distribution of, of cases, a lot of us in this presentation might be able to see the visualization. So when we look at it um, very quickly, we can identify those trends and patterns using those abilities that we have as human beings. But not all of us are lucky enough to see the chart this way. Uh, some people might actually see the chart this way because they have a central field loss their visual, uh, in their ability to see. Some people might not be able to view in periphery and there's a peripheral field loss and this is how they would view the chart. And other people might not be able to see the chart at all. So they would be viewing it like this. So going back to our original visualization, it's important to think about how, how can we make this chart provide the same value for the people who are going to see it in the different simulations that I just presented? 
And how can we summarize the chart's main takeaways so that they can still start to understand the key insights and explore the data in the same way in which somebody can that has all of his or her vision. So just to start thinking about this, uh, it's first important to think about the very purpose of the chart because charts can have a lot of different purposes. They can serve a lot of different use cases and they can tell all different kinds of stories. So I'm gonna show a few examples here and hopefully this will start to stimulate some thinking in how to best approach summarizing a chart, highlighting interesting information and providing necessary takeaways. So again, uh, for those of you folks out there who uh, have studied uh, Tufti or are fans of his uh, writings, you might be familiar with this visualization. This is actually a map of London that was drawn up during the cholera outbreak in 1854. Uh, this was created by Dr. John Snow. And at the time there was a lot of uncertainty um, around how the disease was spreading. Some folks thought it was spreading through the air, um, contact with you know, you know, certain objects and other people. There were a lot of myths at the time spreading. And Dr. Snow really wanted to investigate the root cause of the spread of this particular disease. So what he did was he laid out this map and anytime he learned about a new case, he placed a tick mark on the address where the case was reported on this map. And very quickly, he was able to spot an obvious pattern that there was a high concentration of tick marks next to the local pumping stations. And this helped him start to understand that uh, cholera was actually spreading through the water. And really this helped him unlock the next set of follow-up questions to ask. Um, and it led him down the path of his investigation. Now, when he started to conclude that it definitely was being spread through the water and through the pumping stations, he then used this visualization as a tool for convincing London city officials to shut down the pumps, thus curbing the spread of the disease. So this visualization actually served two purposes. First and foremost, it was a tool, it was an analytical tool. We can think of Dr. Snow as a, a data analyst, if you will. And he didn't really know what questions this map was going to answer, but it helped him uncover the next set of questions to answer and it helped him along in his investigation. Then later on, this map was used as a presentation tool, which led to him um, presenting it to the city officials who ultimately made the decision to shut off the pumps. Now, in comparison, if we're thinking about Dr. Snow's cholera map as an analytical tool, there's other visualizations that are a little more utility and focus. So if we look at this stock chart, for example, we have a pretty good idea of the questions that this chart is going to answer. So if you think about, you know, when you go to uh, check up on a particular stock, you're interested in a few things most likely. What's the current value of the stock? Um, is it higher or lower than it was when you had previously checked it? And what is the recent trend line looking like? Has it been going up or down over time? And then finally, another example that I'm going to share is this vaccination chart. So this is a visualization of the efficacy of the measles vaccine. It's really interesting because it shows um, a heat map here where we can see the efficacy in, in different states in, in the US. And really the key takeaway here is highlighted front and center. And that's because this visualization was meant to support a larger narrative. And visualizations like this usually live in news articles. They might live in with other visualizations in dashboards where all the takeaways are highlighted for you. They could be used in an executive presentation. And the purpose of these visualizations is to really cite evidence um, against some of the points that are made uh, in the narrative. So here, we're, we're basically saying, here's what's interesting in this graph, and this is what you should be focusing on as a viewer, and it's supporting a larger story. So these three examples that I shared are way different, right? We had the Dr. Snow map, which uh, he was using uh, as a tool for analysis, root cause analysis. Uh, we have the stock chart, which is presenting information that's answering questions that, as designers, we already know the questions that this chart is answering, so it's very utility. It's very um, utility in nature and its focus. And then we also have the uh, measles efficacy chart, which is supporting a larger narrative. And if you think about, you know, how do we summarize these different charts through a screen reader? It's really important to think about the core purpose of the charts 
and what this chart is going to do for the viewer and what actions they're going to take as a result of looking at it. And we start to think about the purpose that unlocks ways in which we can think about what about the chart or what information might be interesting to highlight in a summary. And then we're actually adding more value for people who see the chart like this. But more importantly, for people who see the chart this way, we're giving them access to the information for the very first time, which I think is a, a very powerful case. So that's why summaries and takeaways are very important, especially for those who can't see. Uh, another principle is around giving clarity of focus. There are many ways in which we can interpret this one. I'm gonna focus more on color. Uh, chart colors and palettes, uh, it's typically a hot topic around Google. And we get a lot of questions, not only about accessible color palettes, but the usage of color in charts in general. So looking at this example, this might look pretty nice, right? We're using a pastel color set here visually appealing. Since it's a digital well-being chart, it might feel calm and cooling. But the fact of the matter is this. If somebody who has a condition like protonalpia and they're looking at this chart, it becomes much more difficult to read. And you'll notice the other category and the YouTube category almost look like the same color. So now it's hard to differentiate between the two segments of the donut chart and it's really hard to map them back to their corresponding um, items in the legend, making this chart much more difficult to read. And then worse yet, if we were to turn this all the way back to grayscale, this chart becomes virtually impossible to read. So there's a couple of ways that we can think about color here. First of all, using a standard compliant um, color palette. Um, also, along with icons and other graphical elements like textures and accents, uh, to convey meaning. And I'm going to show a few examples of that. We'll start with a color compliant palette. So we've been following WCAG 2.1 standards. Uh, according to the standards, uh, all colors must achieve a three to one contrast ratio with their background. So in this case, when you start to place uh, chart colors on a white background, uh, we need to create a fairly bold palette. Now that kind of limits the amount of colors and the range of shades that, that we can share that are compliant. And when we start to put this into practice, uh, a chart starts to look like this. Now, this is a visualization of, of cloud logs, but it doesn't really matter that, um, you know, we might not understand the actual technicalities behind this visualization, but what I can tell you is this. Um, somebody in DevOps who is looking at this visualization is actually more interested in the uh, segments at the bottom of each stacked bar along this series which represents the alerts and anomalies. Yes, it's nice to know the, you know, the total volume of logs that's occurring over time, but really the focus is meant to be in the bottom. And when you start to use a bold color palette like this, we start to lose that focus. That's why it's really important to use something other than color to convey meaning. Uh, so while this also helps somebody who is colorblind, it also helps um, everyday users because it's drawing their focus to what matters. So if we were to place, let's say, a stroke or a border around the upper segments, we can then use a lighter fill color. WCAG would still be happy with us because we're using technically a compliant color palette in that the border achieves the contrast ratio, it's still readable, yet our focus now is drawn to those lower segments in each bar, those more important data points and metrics that this graph is really bringing to light. Because someone looking at this is really interested in the shape of the data in the bottom segments here. I'm also thinking about ways, I omitted the icons from the previous chart just for the effect of this talk, but also thinking about how iconography and textures can be used to convey meaning too. That just also makes the chart easier to read for somebody who is colorblind or has uh, limited vision in some cases. So these are ways in which we've uh, leveraged graphical accents. And while some of the fills obviously don't meet the contrast requirements, their borders and textures do. And that's all that really mattered at the end of the day. And I also wanted to show this because this is an exercise in showing that, you know, creating accessible color palettes and following accessibility guidelines doesn't necessarily mean that we have to compromise chart design. Now, there is a little bit of a balance because you do toe the line of adding junk, visual junk to the chart. Uh, which we know someone like Tufty would frown upon. But if we do it in an elegant way, I'm still convinced that we can make the chart a bit more readable.
Um, a lot of charts too and common dashboards are meant to communicate status when something's nominal, when something's positive, uh, but more importantly, um, it's meant to surface alerts and anomalies. So here's some ways in which we can do that using these same principles. Uh, you'll notice the donut chart, the empty states, the fills will not pass that color contrast requirement, but we're supplementing that with this nice dotted um, line here around the inside of the donut chart that still reads as an empty state. So if you think about accessibility from the beginning, you can actually still, in my opinion, create a beautiful visualization and really integrate that into the visual design of the chart. If you think about accessibility as an afterthought and you're just going to take an existing chart and slap some iconography onto it, it's probably not going to look so good. And at the end of the day, while it still might pass muster, it might still be more difficult to read. So I wanted to show this as an exercise in thinking about um, how to remain color compliant, designed for um, colorblind users, and think about accessibility upfront because it can lead to some really compelling uh, chart designs. Okay, the next one is about being honest, accessibility in mind or not, this is just common sense, in my opinion, we want our charts to, um, you know, maintain their integrity, and we want to provide a level of transparency. Uh, the way that we do that is allowing access to the charts underlying data. So as I mentioned before, this can also be useful to those people who are using assistive technology, especially screen readers. Um, but also it provides some insight into the methods in which the data was collected and how it's rendered on the actual chart. So this is a visualization that's available if you search for COVID stats. It was showing tests administered over time. And you'll notice actually front and center, uh, after the headline, the first thing that we see is a link to the data set. We actually are very transparency about the data recency. Um, and then at the bottom, we're also making notes on how the data is uh, collected and rendered in the chart. And you can even meet, read more about the underlying data set. Uh, so this is all in the spirit of transparency. And I think this is just a responsible practice in general. Whenever we provide a chart, always making sure we make it very clear of how recent the data is and uh, its collection methods and even providing access to the data. And then finally, in this first five of the six principles, uh, delight is always a favorite of mine. Uh, over the years, we get a lot of questions from product managers and even folks inside and outside of Google around accessibility. Uh, we get a lot of questions around, you know, should we even be thinking about this? Are there really that many people that you know, need this kind of thought put into a design? And the answer to that is a, a resounding yes. So according to the CDC, uh, one in four people in America uh, actually has a disability. And as I mentioned before, uh, over 4 million people in the United States uh, rely on assistive technology to view digital content. So those are actually bigger numbers than you might initially think. Um, but in addition to that, if you just think about how to make information more accessible, you're actually already augmenting the experience for those who have all their abilities. And really the end experience, um, is going to be that much better for everyone. And as I hopefully have demonstrated in some of the previous examples, you don't necessarily have to uh, compromise design. So in my opinion, a fine example of this, and we're just gonna do another quick thought activity here, is uh, we're gonna take a look at this ordinary nest hub, and we're just gonna pretend that we asked it for a stock quote. Now, if we think about the technology that's available on the nest hub, it can provide a narrated response to your query. Uh, it can play audio tones and music, and it also has this very nice screen where we can feature a very um, rich visualization that has the proper contrast for uh, folks who might be colorblind. Um, and we might be able to present the information in a way that caters to folks who um, might not be able to see. So how would we do that? So we could create a rich visualization to display on the screen. Uh, we might use sonification, which is a tool that um, different teams and companies have been experimenting with. If you do a quick search in that, there's some interesting information out there. What that means is if we were to show a trend line for this uh, particular stock quote, you could play some musical notes, uh, sounds, tones that kind of match the, uh, the slope of the trend line and think about some different bars that you could play to represent the, uh, the positive or negative trend. You could also think about how to pair that with a narrated response that really you know, makes the information clear. And if you think about the use case here, when you're asking a Google Home for this kind of information, 
even if you do not have a disability, you might not actually be looking at the device. So thinking about ways in which we can use audio and sound to communicate the information in this visualization that we might hypothetically show on screen here. I also wanted to show um, this quick visual because if we start thinking about accessibility first, especially in the visual um, presentation of the information and how we represent data, we've been noticing that we're really pushing the limits of some existing charts into new and exciting territories, especially when we start to use multiple encodings to show the same information. And even sometimes we're, we're almost getting into the territory of inventing some, some new charts, but of course, you know, keeping purpose and, and use in mind for that, not just doing it for the sake of doing it. So, I talked a lot about how to apply the first five of the six principles to charts. Let's talk about how to scale up some of this thinking here. And really our sixth guiding principle is all around embracing scale. So um, a lot of organizations might not have the you know, accessibility as a top level priority. Um, some organizations um, you know, might uh, be understaffed and under-resourced and have other goals that they might be focusing on. Uh, but there's different ways in which you can scale up this knowledge. So if you start looking into data accessibility as a designer, let's say that you know you work at a consultancy and your consultancy um, is working for a particular client, just already starting to think about data accessibility and the charts and visualizations you're designing for your products. Um, think about ways in which you might be able to contribute those patterns to that client's design system. And most good design uh, systems should be backed by coded components. And if that's the case, see if your contributions can actually make their way into um, the coded uh, charting component. And then whether you're working in consulting or even if you're working in-house, right? And uh, you either own a design system, then you can actually start thinking about this and, and doing your own research and publishing some of your work into the library. Um, if you have the ability to contribute to your company's design system, that's a way that uh, you might be able to, to scale up this thinking too. And I mentioned coded components because if you do have access to a design system that is backed by coded components and you get that work into that component library, then you can be rest assured that any feature team, any product team that is using that componentry is going to get that accessibility information for free, just embedded in the visualization. And based on our past experience too, um, looking at how products are scrutinized when they're going for a VPAT audit, we can say that the auditors do look at visualizations. And based on what we know about an audit, we know that a visualization could block a VPAT from being published. So if you're looking to make a case for why this matters, um, looking at you know, public sector deals, government contracts, uh, a lot of them require accessible products and a chart can actually be a blocker there. So it's important to really think about that. Think how you can contribute this knowledge into your client's design system, your own company's design system, and, and start getting it out there into practice. So uh, Material is our design system of record and, and we've been publishing a lot of our, our knowledge there. Um, just a parting thought on all of this. So we covered the, the six guiding principles, starting with the foundational principles. We talked about delight, why accessibility is important and how to scale up uh, the knowledge through a design system. On my parting thought though, we still really focused on how we might make visualizations accept, uh, accessible. And I think if we continue down that path, we're starting to miss out on a larger opportunity. Uh, and that is when we start to think about, you know, how might we make data accessible to everyone? The answer to that question might not actually be through a visualization. It could be by some sort of alternative method. It could be through some sort of multi-sensory experience. So if you take away anything from this talk, I'm asking you to do this. And that is to join me in answering this question as we all work together on making our respective products and experiences more accessible and inclusive for everyone to enjoy. So thank you very much. Uh, really appreciated your time and attendance in this talk. I hope you found it uh, useful and insightful. Uh, if you did like this talk, feel free to follow me on social media. I'm actually fairly active on all of these outlets here. 
Um, I do a lot of posting on data visualization, drawing, visual languages, and accessibility. Uh, I'm actually uh, in the process of, of publishing a book, so I'm testing some content um, on my social media channels for that as well, and would love your feedback, and I'd love to connect with you. And uh, if you'd want to like to uh, post any of your own content, feel free to use the hashtag available here too. And uh, I'd also love to hear from you. So feel free to, to reach out if you'd want to chat about the topic a bit more in a one-on-one -on -one session. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kent. That was wonderful. Um, we already have some questions pouring in for you and a lot of thank yous in the chat. I don't know how much you're looking at the chat, but I just want to call that out. Um, so I'm just gonna go in order of these because it seems like the upvoting hasn't really started yet. Um, yeah. So we have a question from Joe Martin. Do you have any suggestions where I could learn in detail data visualizations like Power BI or BI and Tableau to let employers know that I have the knowledge even though I do not have the experience in them? I'm sorry, can you uh, can you repeat the first part of the questions? We're talking about um, um, Tableau and Power BI. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions where somebody could learn about, it seems like they want to know how to learn about them in detail. So they want to have the knowledge, even though they don't want to have the experience. I'm, I'm guessing, and Joe, please write to me if I'm getting this wrong. Um, it seems like they're asking about how they can get experience in it Got by it. teaching themselves. Okay. So if we're, if we're thinking about data viz, right, which is like the first part of the presentation, there's a lot of excellent resources out there. So, um, you can, you can take a look at um, the material guidelines. We actually offer um, hints on how to choose the right chart. Um, we can show which type of charts in our documentation will show like distribution or a comparison between two variables or changes in a metric over time and make recommendations on when certain charts will work well. A lot of the visualizations I shared tonight were a bit more complex in nature, but if we're talking about just you know fundamental dashboard charts, uh, there's uh, there's a lot of good resources out there. I, I'm I helped write that, and I, I kind of know what's what's in there. So there's a lot of really basic information. Um, if you want to get into some design principles, um, I've always been a fan of uh, Tufty's books. Uh, he makes a lot of great cases just for um, best practices that you know we use every day in our work. I had mentioned things like chart junk, for example, in in this talk, but there's a whole plethora of other things to think about when designing charts. And then the other thing that I would highly recommend too is um, you know, if you if you have the ability to create charts through some sort of tool or if you're using Tableau, just kind of jumping in and experimenting with the data set and seeing how you can represent it in different ways. Uh, because actually playing with real data up front is going to help you build a better and more effective chart. Because if you're sitting there just kind of drawing a picture of a chart that you think you want to use or creating a mock-up, a lot of times you're not really accounting for a lot of the edge cases that come up. So being able to actually play with the data as soon as possible is actually going to help you learn a lot about um, the visualizations and stuff like that. Uh, there's also some really great blogs out there. I'd be happy to you know, connect in and share some, some links and stuff like that too, if it's uh, useful. It's a lot to get into. Yeah, I was going to say, do you think it'd be possible to maybe give, um, we send follow-up emails to these events, um, yeah. and I think it'd be great to include some of the resources you're talking about in them. So could we, could you just email them to me possibly? Sure. Absolutely. And then, of course, anyone who wants to connect with you, free to connect with you. But I just want to make sure everyone gets those resources um, so you're not having 30 different people write to you. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, wonderful. All right. On to the next question um, from Wally Z. How much do you consider color contrast between visualization layers? It's one thing to differentiate the elements from their background, but how can you be sure that each individual layer is distinguishable from the others? Like yeah, that, that is a, an awesome question. I didn't really touch upon that in this talk because it was a little more basic in nature. So there's a couple additional things to think about. So um, if we think about interacting with the, the data points and the visualization, those interactive states typically have to also achieve the color contrast ratio. So imagine we're working with a bar chart. Now we want to show like a highlighted state on the bar chart. You could use a darker color perhaps to, to communicate that. But if you're actually you know, in a situation where you might need to combine states, maybe you need to show a focus state and you need to show like a mouse hover state at the same time. And believe it or not, there's a lot of cases where, where that would happen. Or maybe 
you're searching through a large network visualization, you're trying to filter through the different nodes and you wanna look for a specific type of node. Um, we wanna show a matched filter state, right? So all those things have to achieve uh, the proper contrast ratio, whether it's a, a filter match state, a focus state, a hover state, or even a combination of all those states. So a lot of times what we try to do is like add the states around the element and we also want to do it in a way where we're not obstructing other data presented in the chart. So that's one thing to think about is kind of like the interaction layer, if you will. If you're working with like annotations and other data layers, uh, there's a couple things that you can take into account. So if we're going to overlay it right on top of the bar in the bar chart or whatever, you know, we're using a, a bubble plot or a scatter plot um, donut chart. Um, it, a lot of times what we'll try to do, I, you know, it, I would recommend using something like a tooltip where there might be a light background over top of the annotation. And yes, that might obstruct some of the data. You could think about how to best position it so that maybe it points to the, the data that's you know, in question, but doesn't obstruct it. And then um, some of the other ways to think about it um, and some of our more complex visualizations, like when, we were, when I was reviewing like Project Loon and stuff like that, ways in which we thought about data overlays there because we, we very much uh, relied on it was thinking about only showing the information in the visualization and that's in context to the overlay. So I'm um, trying to kind of take out all the noise opens up more screen real estate to um, play with. Uh, so you can start to add more overlays to that. Um, that also opens up some other colors that you might want to use. I'm hesitant to say like, you know, use color on top of color because that can get very messy very quickly. Uh, ways we tried to skirt that would be using like white borders. Um, if you actually go to a dark UI uh, and have the luxury of being able to do that, it actually opens up a wider range of colors that will meet the proper contrast ratios that you can work with. Uh, one thing I didn't mention in the talk too that's worth considering is if you're using borders and those borders are less than three pixels in weight, then your requirements for color contrast actually bump up. So it's no longer acceptable to meet the three one contrast ratio. You have to meet a 4.5 to one contrast ratio. And when you start thinking about you know, how this works and you start creating a mock-up or maybe you're working in an actual prototype, it really kind of limits what you can do by layering colors on top of colors and you become more reliant upon other things like position and how to structure the overlay in a way that where you know the different um, the information on the overlay points to the right data and focus in your visualization. Also, too, like if you think um, when we were working on, um, I'll go back to the loon example because I mentioned that uh, we were thinking about ways to visualize the environmental impacts on um, a balloon and how the environment and physical factors in the environment were affecting a balloon's ability to communicate with the ground station. Um, you can feel free, Loon just launched its uh, book of knowledge and a lot of this is, mo actually all of this is, is listed in there. Uh, there are a couple ways that we were thinking about visualizing um, the environmental factors and we did this all through data overlay. So one was uh, a precipitation map. And because, uh, you know, precipitation will lead to signal attenuation between um, a balloon and the ground station. And um, we are also trying to visualize factors like wind and um, you know, cloud density. And we had to be very careful about all the overlays that we could show at the same time. So being very thoughtful about what overlays are going to present information that you want to see because you want to see the correlation between those different metrics within the overlays versus what overlays should you turn off if you turn a, a certain set on uh, became very crucial because there was no way you could show every overlay on the geographical visualization that I shared um, you know, with that in mind, even if you weren't even thinking about color contrast or trying to force too much into the visualization at once. So also being very um, cognizant and sensitive to the type of information that you're going to share and really how it's going to answer the questions that your uh, end customers are going to be asking of the data. So I could go on and on more. Does that answer the question at least for now? Um, we actually did get feedback that it wasn't exactly what they were asking, but what okay. you talked about was even more interesting. So oh, cool. I think that you went above and beyond answering the question. Um, awesome. I'm going to move on to the next one because I know we only have about like 10 more minutes of Q&A time. Okay. 
Um, next question. Hi, this was great. Do you have any examples to share of the audio navigation experience of a complex visualization like the Tufty example? It would seem you have to take a storytelling approach. So if you can speak <laughs> about how, I know that Tufty visualization is just so rich and has yeah. so many layers to it. So talking that's, about how something like that could be made into that, an audio experience. That's a multivariate experience. Now, if you look at the resources that exist today, this is a relatively new area. And you know that, that might sound like a bit of a cop-out, but even when we were talking about the ARIA roles and attributes, um, some of the newer ones that are, you know, specifically created for data visualization aren't actually approved yet by the, the WCAGs, by WCAGs, so they're still kind of in this experimental mode. That just kind of goes to show how new this area is in, in a lot of ways. Now, um, with that being said, there, you know, there isn't a lot of research into, you know, rich screen reader announcements for complex visualizations like the, the Menard map that showed the Napoleon invasion of Moscow in, in the War of uh, 1812. Um, but that being said, there's been a lot of different people at a lot of different companies starting to think about this. This is a topic that's um, becoming more and more popular over time. A lot of the guidelines and research that you're going to find today apply to basic charts. And I will give a shout out to High Charts. It's actually a really nice uh, data visualization component library for just common dashboard charts, you know, pie charts, bar charts, area charts. The usual suspects you'll find on your typical dashboard project and they have a really nice accessibility module so i'd encourage you to take a look at that and the type of screen reader announcements that they provide but really we're getting into the the territory of um, uncharted waters to some degree especially when we get into those complex and and rich visualizations um just to kind of throw a few thoughts out there ways that we would think about it um, because the team that i work on we create charting components for a lot of google products and just like any component library would, um, just kind of guiding other feature teams in, in how to present the right uh, screen reader announcements is important. And there's been a lot of thought put into you know, how to do this right. Um, there's been a lot of speculation kind of out there in the industry. Can we use AI to, to provide the proper summary and highlight what's interesting in a chart? Um, but just being able, able to um, state like the chart's purpose, what information is represented in the chart, and then also um, thinking about what's going to be interesting to that, that end user. And I, I shared the three different examples, right? The, the analyst chart, the utility chart, and the chart that supports a narrative. Um, for the analyst, they're probably interested in the shape of the data, right? So is there an unexpected spike? Is there an unexpected dip? Is there a trend that's you know, different than what I would expect? You know, Maybe a way to, to summarize that, for example, is saying, OK, the screen reader is going to recite points in time. Let's say there's a time series and the screen reader is going to announce points in time where maybe the data is one or two standard deviations above or below the mean, because that could mean something interesting for somebody who's interested in that type of data. Maybe if there's somebody who's like monitoring an alarm system or an alerting system, they might just be interested in the most recent fire that they have to put out. So the screen reader summary would focus a bit more on that. Uh, so those are some ways in which you could start to think about it, but is there a concrete example I can point you to? Uh, unfortunately, you know, not to my knowledge at this point, but I could obviously check with some of my peers and colleagues too. Sounds like you have your work cut out for you. <laughs> <laughs> there's also take a take a look at sonification because there's some really interesting work and in, um, public work being done there, and in how sonification is used to communicate information in charts. Cool, wonderful. That was very interesting to think about the future of complex charts mm -hmm. like that. Um, next question. Thanks for the talk, Kent. Really learned a lot in the presentation. I have a question about the last point about regarding point regarding embracing scale. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that if you're developing charting or plotting tools, even to be used in-house, then downstream dependents of those tools will get the ally for free. Can mm -hmm. you please speak a little bit about the shared one, the shared onus between tool creators and chart art authors in making data more accessible? Sure. So a, a lot of the ideas, if you have robust guidelines, um, so there's kind of like two ways to think about it. You have the actual charting component. Um, if built right, that would be shipping with the proper ARIA landmarks roles. It would be built in 
the best way possible to communicate its intent to the browser. And that would obviously be passed on to the screen reader. So like those foundational principles should come for free in the code. But if you have nice design guidelines to pair with it, that's where you can start describing the charts usage. So just like you would explain why you would use a bar chart versus a line chart versus a, a donut chart and, and what that's going to do best, you could start to create some guidelines as, um, you know, how you can bring accessibility to that. And a lot of that, again, is going back to the purpose of that chart. So whether it's in some sort of documented form that if you have like a self-service model where a team's going to pick up your component, they're going to read your design guidelines and hope, hopefully, you know, implement it uh, in, in a thoughtful way, um, you could kind of go along that path. Another, another thing that you might consider is if you own a design system and you, you don't already have one, a contribution model is a very nice way to go, uh, especially if you're limited on resources or if the design system is actually a side project by some other team um, within your organization, or if you, know, you own it, but you don't have the time to put into it, um, opening up avenues for contributions is good. That's also going to help you connect. If you own the charting component, that's going to help you connect with other people in your organization, learn about their use cases. And you can start, you know, polling your customers internally and seeing, okay, are these features or scenarios in demand? Are these, you know, frequently asked for things that we have to start thinking about? And you can start to tailor your accessibility experience um, to what's in demand by, you know, your the customers within your organization being feature teams or those who are, are consuming the design system and integrating your components into products or websites. Awesome. awesome. Does that answer the question? Again, that's another one I could kind of go off on for a while. Yeah, I, I'm assuming it answered the question. Okay. I haven't heard otherwise in the chat, um, but I, I thought it was a great answer. Uh, cool. I got it, something out of it. So I'm assuming everyone <laughs> awesome. else did as well. Um, awesome. And for the sake of time, I'm going to throw one more quick question sure. at you, and then we're going to have to wrap up. Um, so last question, thank you so much for the amazing presentation. I saw so many amazing sketches and paper prototypes when considering, considering visualization. How important are paper sketches in your design visualization process? Ah. And what is your favorite tool when designing these visualizations? This is an awesome question. Okay, so a couple things to unpack here. Sketching is very near and dear to my heart and it's something I use every day. Now on a lot of there's a time and a place for it though. So um, I'm a big proponent of participatory design exercises, workshops with you know, colleagues, stakeholders, and, and in some cases, if we can pull a subject matter expert in or even gain insight from an end customer, that, that's even better. And really in those sessions, that's where we're, there's, you know, if, if you ever read like the Google Sprint book, it kind of gives you, it's the design thinking process really. So uh, as a collective, we go through all the steps in that process. Um, early on, there's, um, I always use drawing for early ideas. So when we're learning about the problem space and kind of synthesizing that information, um, I'll do a few quick mappings of my own to kind of help me make sense of the problem space, do a quick doodles of ideas that I might want to start maturing when we get into the ideation phase. And really when we're ideating as a group, that's where it gets interesting because that's where you can really show a breadth of thinking. So if you really understand the challenge at hand, Maybe it's a visualization challenge and we know the questions that we're trying to answer. That's where you can explore a different range of charts, see what resonates with your group. And you know, if you follow like the, the true sprint methodology and you know, you're, you're doing exercises like crazy eights and um, you're thinking about you know, quantity of ideas over quality and you start to see what is resonating with the rest of the group and what ideas that they're converging on. I usually try to mature those sketches and introduce new ways to visualize that information uh, just to open up other people's idea within the group. So sketching is really, really important uh, to me, even though we're not necessarily working with the actual data also keeping in mind, one of the questions I'll usually ask early on is, in addition to understanding the question the chart or charts is going to answer, understand the magnitude of the data. So like if we're creating a network visualization, are we on the order of tens of nodes, hundreds of nodes, or thousands of nodes? Because that's really going to influence the way I, I draw that picture and, and speak to how it could work in real life. And understanding kind of like having a basic understanding of some of the edge cases that you might encounter in some of the scenarios is going to be helpful in drawing. So pen and paper, hands down, one of my favorite tools. Now, that being said, I've always been into um, building actual prototypes. So I'll go over to like P5, which is um, a version of what was processing, but it's, it's web enabled. I also am a 
big proponent of D3JS because that provides a lot of nice building blocks for creating any visualization. Um, there's also the Vega library, which is built on D3, but gives you like a predefined set of charts. Um, a lot of people use Observable and will create a quick Observable notebook that you can share with your other design colleagues and even like UXE colleagues where you can make little tweaks to CSS and see how that affects an actual visualization that's hooked up to a real data set. Uh, so for me, those are some really excellent visualization tools. If I have a good idea of the problem space and um, I feel comfortable enough. I'll just resort to Figma and do a quick mock-up as long as I know I can speak to the possible edge cases and scenarios that come up. And I think as you do this more and more, you can start to anticipate that and be able to kind of be ready for it and, and speak to it. So there's a wide range of design tools, but drawing is really important, especially early on in the process for opening up the, you know, the, uh, the creativity of colleagues and, and starting a dialogue around alternative ways to, um, you know, represent data and information in a product. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I agree with the pen and paper for sure. Yeah. Um, and the person that asked that question said, this is so awesome. Thank you so much. So I think they got what they were looking for. Cool. Um, cool. Thank you to everyone who participated, who asked questions, who upvoted questions. Um, thank you again to Kent for a wonderful, wonderful um, presentation. Um, that is all we, or no, we still have raffle winners. Um, yeah, I think we have the everything. raffle winners ready to go. Awesome. Can I just say one more thing real quick? Yes, of um, course. This is a presentation I'm going to be giving at, at future conferences. So if anybody has any feedback or ways in which they, this could be better presented or even topics that um, you felt we should have explored and, and didn't. I just love to hear that feedback because I'm always evolving this talk and, and trying to make it better. Uh, I am going to be presenting this at the spring um, coming up and I'll have more information on that in another week or two. And uh, if you want to see this talk again, it's always being updated with more research and examples. And I try to change it up so it's never a rerun for anyone. Uh, so I'd love feedback. And if you want to see it again, feel free to do so. There's going to be um, you know, new information at that point in time. So anyway, thank you very much for coming out. And uh, Remy, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks. Okay. For sure. I'm actually going to um, pop it on over to Raisha because I know she has the names of our raffle winners. Yes. Firstly, thank you, Ken. That was an amazing presentation. Today, time just flew and, <laughs> and I really loved it. Thank you. So uh, um, we are almost at the end of the event and I do have the raffle winners. So the first winner is Ivana Serik. Second one is Emma Barker. And the third one is David Arculeta. So congratulations, guys. And we will follow up with you by email and send you the physical book, no matter where you are in the world. So I'll pass it on to Ben to wrap up now. All right. Thanks, Raisha. Um, I want to say thanks again to Kent. This was really amazing talk. Love, loved your passion. and. Um, I feel like the onus is now on all of us to, to put this into practice. Um, also, I wanted to, to point out that anyone who doesn't know, Kent has a YouTube where he talks about sketching. That's really interesting. So it kind of relates to that last question. Um, I want to thank our sponsors again for making tonight possible, especially Boomi and Tracy and your team at the, the UX organization over there. Really appreciate your support. Thank you all for, for coming out tonight. Um, it was awesome to see all the engagement and uh, the great questions. Sorry, we couldn't get to all of them. With that, uh, please stay connected with us and we will see you at World Usability Day next month. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Have a great night. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thank you.